Well, thank you very much uh, for having me. And uh, as was mentioned, I am from the South Australian government, those very evil people who believe that we should be investing in renewable energy uh, to fight climate change. Sounds like I'm amongst friends here today. Um, officially, just want to acknowledge I'm here representing the government and uh, particularly our Energy Minister Tom Kutsutonis, who sends his apologies today. Um, before I turn to um, community energy specifically, I wanted to touch on some of the broader issues to do with energy policy, and particularly those that affect South Australia, because we've all heard over the last six months or so a lot of misinformation and a lot of scare campaigning on energy policy in Australia. And I think it's important to set out a lot of the complexities that often get missed when people wave around big chunks of coal in federal parliament. So there's a few factors that I think are really important to look at in South Australia. One is that we have a privatised network in all respects in South Australia. As Shane was talking about earlier, that has an important role in terms of the motivation is for people to make money out of the system at all elements, whether it's generation, distribution, um, transmission and retail. Um, it also means that uh, you know the state government has limited ability to control that market compared to what we used to when those uh, all of those elements were owned by the people of South Australia. Our market has also developed since privatisation with a large percentage of generation and retail controlled by two companies, essentially in an oligopoly. The largest part of our generation system also has always been gas, and that's very important to look at because this varies with other states, and the fact is that the gas price in Australia has been rising dramatically for domestic purposes, um, and that has had a large impact upon prices in South Australia through our gas turbines. And through the um, load shedding that we saw recently, if the gas price was lower, then we would have had uh, Pelican Point turning on sooner without a direction, um, and we wouldn't have had the load shedding that we saw. So gas prices have an essential role to play. Um, we also have very limited interconnection to other states. Um, there was a proposed interconnector to New South Wales that was stopped in the 1990s because it might have lessened the price that uh, privatisation would have got uh, when it was sold. So we only connect into Victoria, whereas if you compare that to Victoria, they connect into New South Wales, South Australia and Tasmania. So they have a lot of other options in terms of the national grid. We also have a grid in South Australia that's a lot longer and skinnier than other states. We have a very spread out regional population, uh, which is an important consideration for community <coughs> energy projects. Um, and we also have a very peaky demand system. So on a hot summer day, we'll have uh, at over double the demand that we might on a winter's day in South Australia. So all of those play into the price and reliability of our network. But all of those details get a bit lost when you've got the Prime Minister and Federal Treasurer taking into Parliament a big chunk of coal, waving it around, and blaming renewable energy for all of the problems of our national electricity market. We believe that it's very reckless and dangerous to trash our once bipartisan agreement that we should take action to fight climate change. We believe that our national market is broken. We also believe that our national electricity market is broken and in need of significant repair. This is true in terms of the rules, the operations, and most importantly, the incentives in the system for investment in low, lower carbon emitting generation. So we've been calling upon the federal government to back the experts, to back all the independent panels, to back all the independent economists who have been saying that we should have a national emissions intensity scheme. This is, of course, the same scheme that the Prime Minister proposed himself when he was Leader of the Opposition back in 2009, back when he sadly wasn't desperately appealing to the right wing of his party and to One Nation voters to cling on to power. Supporting such a scheme is what the private sector has been waiting for, to allow them to make long-term investments that the energy grid desperately needs. So how does this connect to community energy? Well, everybody here knows that there is tremendous opportunity for community energy projects in Australia. The sort of projects that can deliver low carbon or zero carbon emissions, and the sort of projects that can work on a local level to solve local energy problems. It can fill the gap in the market between household and utility scale generation. It can unlock projects that would have otherwise not gone ahead, leading the way to our energy systems for the future. 
But just like the broader energy market, the key to unlocking this potential is to have national policy settings that give certainty for people to make investments. The sooner we stop proposals for massive taxpayer injections into fake clean coal investments and properly incentivise renewable energy and storing solutions, the quicker the economics of community energy projects will become realised in Australia. As has been widely discussed, South Australia has led the nation in setting policy frameworks and processes for renewable energy growth. And in 2015-16, 43% of our energy that was generated came from renewable sources in South Australia. And that figure is poised to grow even further this financial year. And we've now set the ambitious target for the City of Adelaide to become the world's first carbon neutral city. And to deliver on that target, we're working between state and local governments on some community level projects. And there's a key connection between our target there and work we're doing on a community level basis. Within our City of Adelaide, we have a sustainability incentive scheme funded by the Council and the State Government, providing financial rebates to residents, businesses and community organisations for a range of different initiatives, including solar PV, energy storage, EV charging points, solar hot water, energy monitoring and LED lighting. We also have the Solar Savers Adelaide program running with the Council, designed to remove the barrier of upfront installation costs for solar PV systems for low-income residents and rental properties in the Adelaide City Council area. <laughs> Under the first stage of that project, it will fund the installation of up to 100 2 kilowatt solar PV energy systems on eligible homes, which property owners will pay off the cost over a 10-year period through a separate rate charge quarterly to the property. And we're also working on connecting 400 solar PV systems on public housing properties, 200 which will be installed in the city centre and 200 across the rest of South Australia. With the right investment environment, there are many more opportunities that can then be leveraged across South Australia. I just want to dwell on one example, um, which is an example of getting the economics of this right, which is on Kangaroo Island which I think a number of other speakers might be talking on during this conference. It's an example where some of the highlights of the opportunities, but also some of the cost considerations of community energy. The, on the island, which has about three or 4,000 people when it's not tourist season, electricity runs through a 15 kilometre long submarine cable, which is reaching the end of its life. So the question is whether to replace that tape cable or to do other projects. There's been a long discussion based on, around the community about whether there could be a community energy project to set up um, renewable energy, biomass, solar and diesel generation. The cost of that was estimated to be around $33.6 million. SA Power Networks, which is our private uh, Hong Kong owned company that runs uh, the distribution across South Australia, has preferred and its recommended option is to replace the cable at an estimated $25 million, so considerably cheaper than the self-sustaining option. Um, Kangaroo Island people do want the cable replaced and hopefully even if the cable is replaced then it will lead to other energy, op renewable energy op opportunities in the future on the island. Um, however it does highlight that we need to bridge that gap between the lowest cost and what can be the most sustainable and carbon neutral outlook for the state and the country. I'll skip through some of it because I'm getting the wind up. Um, also, just wanted to quickly highlight as well that we do need to consider a lot of um, the work that needs to happen for how this fits into our regulatory system and also how it impacts upon the rest of the grid. And our energy regulator in South Australia, Escoza, is doing a lot of work on off-the-grid regulation on how we can best improve um, our regulation to make sure that we can um, fit these new types of community energy projects including off-the-grid projects that are going to be happening in the future. But we do need to work through on a national basis how that we are going to continue the grid and how sustainable that's going to be as more and more people are leaving it uh, because obviously we do need the grid um, for the vast majority of the population. So I hope some of these examples and these explanations explain some of the current framework in South Australia and also how we are committed to continuing our great work that we've done on renewable energy in the future 
and how we need to take on those who are sadly using this argument and some of the natural events that we've had for their own sad political gain. Thank you very much.